Good evening. Welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, October the 9th. Today is the day the Church commemorates the life of Abraham. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 10. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the day, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my father, who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And today is the day the Church commemorates the life of Abraham. Abraham, known early in his life as Abram, was called by God to become the father of a great nation, Genesis 12. At age 75, in an obedience to God's command, he, his wife, Sarah, and his nephew Lot moved southwest from the town of Haran to the land of Canaan. There God established a covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15:18, promising the land of Canaan to his descendants. When Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, they were blessed with Isaac, the son long promised to them by, by God. 
Abraham demonstrated supreme obedience when God commanded him to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. God spared the young man's life only at the last moment and provided a ram as a substitute offering. Genesis 22, 1 to 19. Abraham died at age 175 and was buried in the cave of Machpelah, where he had purchased earlier as a burial site for Sarah. He is especially honored as the first of the three great Old Testament patriarchs and for his righteousness before God through faith. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is our continuation of Article 12 in the Apology on Repentance. As you recall, the last couple paragraphs before where we pick it up tonight was talking about how the adversaries, the Church of Rome, uh, were attaching all kinds of conditions to absolution, uh, penance and making satisfactions, uh, because by their uh, doctrine, that means that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not sufficient uh, to forgive everyone's sins. The confessors continue. Then, just as they redeem purgatory by means of satisfactions, so a scheme was created for redeeming satisfactions, which was most abundant in revenue. They sell indulgences, which they interpret as the par a pardon of satisfactions. This revenue is not only from the living, but is much more plentiful from the dead. Nor do they redeem the satisfactions of the dead only by indulgences, but also by the sacrifice of the Mass. In a word, the topic of satisfaction is infinite. And just a quick note there, uh, talking about the, sac the sacrifice of the Mass is the Roman Catholic doctrine that the priest is re-sacrificing Jesus to the Father. Making, of course, the uh, Lord's Supper into a work that man does rather than a gift that man receives. The doctrine of the righteousness of faith in Christ and the benefit of Christ lies buried among these scandals, for we cannot list everything, and doctrines of devils. Therefore, all good people understand that the doctrine of the learned persons and canon lawyers about repentance has been criticized for a useful and godly purpose. For the following teachings are clearly false and foreign, not only to Holy Scripture, but also to the Church Fathers. One. Through good works, apart from grace, we merit grace from the divine covenant. Two, we merit grace by attrition. Three, merely hating the crime is enough for the blotting out of sin. Four, we obtain forgiveness of sins because of contrition and not by faith in Christ. Five, the power of the keys provides the forgiveness of sins before the church, but not before God. Six, sins are not forgiven before God by the power of the keys. Rather, the power of the keys has been set up to transfer eternal punishments to temporal, to put certain satisfactions upon consciences, to set up new acts of worship, and to put consciences in debt to such satisfactions and acts of worship. 7. The listing of offenses in confession as taught by the adversaries is not necessary according to divine right. And just another quick note there. Uh, the a listing of offenses in confession meant you had to list every single sin from the last time you made confession, uh, and you can't forget any of them, because if you don't list them, they are not forgiven, according to their doctrine. 8. Canonical satisfactions are necessary for redeeming the punishment of purgatory, or they benefit as a compensation for blotting out guilt. This is how uninformed persons understand it. Nine. Without a good disposition on the part of the one using it, that is, without faith in Christ, the reception of the sacrament of repentance by the outward act, ex opera operato, obtains grace. 10. Our souls are freed from purgatory through indulgences by the power of the keys. And 11. In the reservation of cases, not only canonical punishment, but also the guilt, should be reversed, reserved for one who is truly converted new section heading, Two Parts of Repentance. To deliver godly consciences from these mazes of the learned persons, we have attributed these two parts to repentance, contrition and faith. If anyone desires to add a third, fruit worthy of repentance, that is, a change of the entire life and character for the better, 
we will not oppose it. We separate from contrition those useless and endless discussions regarding grief from loving God and from fearing punishment. We say that contrition is the true terror of conscience, which feels that God is angry with sin and grieves that it has sinned. This contrition takes place when sins are condemned by God's word. The sum of the preaching of the gospel is this, to convict of sin, to offer for Christ's sake the forgiveness of sins and righteousness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, and that as reborn people we should do good works. So Christ includes the sum of the gospel when he says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Luke 24, 47. Scripture speaks about these terrors. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Psalm 38, verses 4 and 8. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is very troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Psalm 6, verses 2 and 3. I said, in the middle of my days I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I calmed myself until morning. Like a lion, he breaks all my bones. Isaiah 38, 10 and 13. In these terrors, conscience feels God's wrath against sin. This is unknown to secure people living according to the flesh. The conscience sees the corruption of sin and seriously grieves that it has sinned. Meanwhile, it also runs away from God's dreadful anger. Human nature, unless sustained by God's word, cannot endure his anger. So Paul says, For through the law I died to the law. Galatians 2.19 For the law only accuses and terrifies consciences. In these terrors, our adversaries say nothing about faith. They present only the word that convicts of sin. When this is taught alone, it is the doctrine of the law, not of the gospel. By these griefs and terrors, they say, people merit grace as long as they love God. But how will people love God in true terrors when they feel God's horrible wrath, which is beyond words? What besides despair do those people teach who, during these terrors, show forth only the law? As the second part of repentance, we add faith in Christ. The gospel, in which the forgiveness of sins is freely promised concerning Christ, should be presented to consciences in these terrors. They should believe that, for Christ's sake, their sins are freely forgiven. This faith cheers, sustains, and enlivens the contrite, according to Romans 5.1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. This faith obtains the forgiveness of sins. It justifies before God as the same passage testifies, since we have been justified by faith. This faith shows the distinction between the contrition of Judas and Peter, of Saul and David, the contrition of Judas or Saul, Matthew 27, 3 to 5, 1 Samuel 31, 4 to 6, is useless because faith is not added. Faith grasps the forgiveness of sins given as a gift for Christ's sake. So the contrition of David or Peter, 2 Samuel 2, 13, 12, 13, and Matthew 26, 75, helps because faith which takes hold of the forgiveness of sins granted for Christ's sake is added to it. Love is not present before reconciliation has been made through faith. For without Christ, the law is not performed according to Romans 5.2. Through Christ, we have also obtained access to God. This faith grows gradually and throughout the entire life, struggles with sin in order to overcome sin and death. Love follows faith, as we have said above. So childlike fear can be clearly defined as anxiety that has been connected with faith that is, where faith comforts and sustains the anxious heart. It is slavish fear when faith does not sustain the anxious heart. We'll pick up from there on Monday evening. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Holy Christian Church. Forget. Ugh. <clears throat> That's terrible. Let's just start that over. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy, we cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth, and there abandoned by all your disciples. You willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin, you were counted a sinner and hung between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit, so that you could pay our debts and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. You led him to the land of Canaan, and you sealed your covenant with him by the shedding of blood. May we see in Jesus the seed of Abraham, the promise of the new covenant of your holy church, sealed with Jesus' blood on the cross, and given to us now in the cup of the New Testament. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.